June. We're all happy that you can be here to make it. Uh, before we start, and we get into three great presentations, I'll open up the room for any announcements. When's our next? When's the next codex? Uh, yeah, so I might as well announce that. Um, so hi, everybody. This is our last uh, meeting for 2019. Um, for 2020, we will be back um, on January 16th. Uh, so mark your calendars, and you can also um, go ahead and uh, mark um, February 4th. Uh, that will be a presentation by Julian Yarko, uh, a professor at our law school. So um, watch your email for more information about uh, those upcoming events. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. And with that, we'll move into the first of our three presentations. The first is Sarah Pergeline and Pierre Dulce, both of AXA. Um, Parser is an open source solution that extracts structured information from documents such as PDFs to generate readily available, organized, and usable data for data scientists and developers. Sarah and Pierre will present remotely today. Yes, hello. Um, so I'll share my screen uh, and just let me know when you can see it. Oh, we can see it. We're good. Okay, perfect. So, um, hello everyone and uh, uh, thank you uh, for letting us this opportunity to present Parcel and what we have done uh, in terms of data extraction. Uh, just who we are to start, uh, so Pierre and I are from AXA REV. Uh, REV stands for Research Engineering and Vision and we are part of a team that is focusing on technology innovation. And, uh, with this team, we have built Parser. Uh, Parser is a solution that we have developed uh, across the past year. Uh, and the objective is to turn uh, any uh, kind of document into data. The goal is to save any kind of documents, meaning uh, PDF, uh, images, uh, oh, and uh, and to... oh. Hey guys, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry I can't be there in person, but I just came back from a flight. So, sorry, I don't wanna interrupt the flow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to participate remotely. Sorry, Sarah, please proceed. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, so uh, I was saying the, the goal of Parser is um, to take any kind of documents like uh, PDF, uh, TIFF, uh, JPEG, uh, and to uh, clean uh, and extract uh, structured data that we are extracting to make it available actually for data scientists, for example, uh, for them to perform data science project or NLP project uh, and so on. Uh, we have built a generic solution where everything can be configured and uh, where uh, you have a module. Uh, when you have modules that are already existing on the market, we make them available in the parser pipeline uh, to provide the best extraction and the best accuracy possible. Uh, for example, uh, you can do a node switch on any OCR solution. Uh, we support out of the box uh, Cloud Vision, uh, proprietary solution uh, like ABI, or open source solution like Tesseract. And uh, for electronic documents like PDF, uh, we support directly the extraction without uh, OCR. Uh, after the extraction, we actually structure and clean the data uh, to provide you uh, the output uh, that you need. Uh, and I'll give you some example of uh, how Parser was used. So uh, first uh, use case, first example uh, on financial reporting. Um, the objective of Parser was to extract KPIs from financial reports because those KPIs are almost always presented into table and with really, really nice uh, design uh, reports making it harder to extract. Uh, we are using the capacity of uh, reading order uh, to uh, manage the treatment of multi-column, for example. And we have built module for Parser to be able to uh, detect the table in the document and reconstruct it in order to fetch for the KPIs automatically. Uh, and therefore, we managed to improve this automation. Results were uh, good uh, and are uh, enabling a better accuracy and lower cost, uh, lower also human workload and therefore uh, lower human error. Uh, the second example for Parser is on contract loan management. 
uh, contract loan obligation, sorry, um, that are most often contracts of more than 400 pages, uh, where it's difficult for the human to go fetch for the definition of each term and see the difference from a version to another. Uh, so we are using the capability to structure the text, to find the paragrapher where you have the definition. Uh, and that is why extracting all the text with parser, cleaning the data, and being able to look automatically to definition uh, is a process improvement. And that leads also to the third example of a parser that is uh, making, uh, showing the difference. Uh, by using parser, you are able to extract and clean the data and highlight the difference. And because the data is clean, it's more easy to see where the differences are between two, uh, two documents. Um, thanks to this, we can also reduce uh, the human workload uh, and the cost and make a really uh, improvement uh, on the efficiency. Uh, we'll now show you a demo to explain uh, how parser is working. Uh, you will see a UI uh, we have built. Uh, 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 you will see the. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I have a. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of noises actually. Um, it's, uh, hello? Hello. Yeah, is this any better? We had some people just come into the room and it was close to the oh. mic. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, sorry, I was saying that um, uh, we will now show you a demo uh, to explain uh, um, how Parser is working. Uh, and you will see a UI uh, we have built uh, to uh, showcase the result of Parser and also uh, debug the solution when we see, uh, when we see uh, issues. So I'll, I'll launch the demo. So uh, here, uh, yes, uh -huh. so here you can see parser. So uh, you can choose a file, you can choose any type of file. So for example, here you have a PDF and you can see that in this PDF, uh, you have uh, headers, you have a table, you have list. Uh, you have, just have to open it with parser and choose the configuration that you want to run. So choose what you want to uh, apply to your document, for example, the table detection, the heading detection, uh, the hierarchy detection uh, across those heading, and you just have to uh, submit uh, so the document will run through the, the parser pipeline with all the modules that you have configured. And when the process is completed, you have the rendering of this document. Uh, so you can see uh, the same documents, but actually rendering with parser, and you have some visibility filter. So for example, here you can see the words. Uh, you can see each word that is included in the document. We do the same thing with line. We're able to, to reconstruct every line. Uh, you, you see it makes sense when you have a multiple column. Uh, you can uh, uh, see also the paragrapher in the, in the documents, the heading, heading of the documents, but also heading of the table. And if you have some list and table uh, on, on your document, you can see the list that is identified, and you can see the table that not only is identified, but also reconstructed with the right column and the right uh, heading and uh, hierarchy. Uh, this rendering you can extract as an output in several formats. Uh, for example, you can do a markdown. Uh, here, the rendering of the markdown. Um, you have the, 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 this type of document. Uh, it's actually easier for a data scientist to go fetch for the information in a markdown on, or in raw text. Uh, because it's easier to extract than in a PDF document. And for the table, we are able also to extract all table in C uh, CSV. We can extract all the figures in the table in the CSV. Uh, and so uh, that, that, that was uh, that was a parser. Uh, oh, sorry. So um, we have run uh, some benchmark to see how parser perform compared to existing solution. And uh, for now, we are pretty happy with the result because as you can see, uh, we have a better accuracy on a specific module like reading detection, list detection, paragraph reconstruction, but also on the other role. And uh, actually, uh, we are still working on improving the performance. We have uh, three people dedicated to parser, working on one, uh, adding new module to add more configuration to what you can extract, but also always keep improving the accuracy of the data that you are extracting. And we have a commitment uh, on our team to maintain par parser for at least two more years. 
Uh, and the solution was released in open source on August. Uh, it's available uh, for free uh, in beta uh, under Apache 2 uh, licenses. And actually, what we would love is to have uh, other uh, contribute uh, to this uh, really nice project. Uh, and uh, that's the end of the presentation. And now, uh, Pierre and I would be uh, happy to answer any question you might have on Parser. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. So I'll open up the room for questions, please. Uh, one question I had was for words that might have a very, the same or very similar meaning. So for instance, doctor, physician, and at times healthcare provider may all mean essentially the, the same thing. Is there a way to denote the same meaning for multiple words? So when you're doing that search within, you can kind of add multiple meanings and um, extract that. So this is not a capability we provide inside a parser, uh, but it will be easy to build on top of it. Uh, our goal is not to do any NLP or machine learning. Our goal is really to clean the data as clean as possible. So every uh, learning on a legal text or search on a legal text you want to build is easy to build. Uh, okay, thank you, Pierre. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> can I make a quick comment to that? Yeah. Go ahead, Pia. Yeah. Um, just to that point, I, I, I think that the idea of actually having really great tools to clean content into data is fantastic. And you don't actually want to build all the functionality into the one tool. You want to have multiple tools to, to work um, with the data in different ways so that you don't end up with you know, giant behemoth tools that try to do everything to everyone. So um, th this is a really beautiful tool. And I just want to say congratulations as well. It was really well done. Thank you. Thank you. And this is Carl Branting. Um, yes, I, I too am, am, am quite uh, grateful uh, having uh, invested quite a lot of effort in, uh, in, in this barrier uh, to, to sort of downstream HLT uh, processes from extracting uh, uh, from- so What is HLT? 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 Uh, sorry, Carl, could you say again? A sort of human language technology, uh, um, net, computational linguistics. So, um, so extraction from PDF is sort of the bane of, uh, of applying computational linguistics to uh, government and court documents in my experience. Uh, and I've ended up having to spend an awful lot of my uh, sort of resources in, in addressing the problem that you seem to have handled nicely. But I do have one question. So there was a, it looked like there was a, one of the, one of the options was for hierarchy. So um, a challenge that, in, uh, that has have risen in some of the documents I've worked with is that they have a hierarchical nested structure uh, that's quite challenging to reconstruct from the PDF partly because um, governments uh, are, are free to have inconsistent numbering and itemization conventions. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about um, uh, what, if anything, you do to, to address, uh, address that. Or, or are you just rendering, just reproducing the indentation in the original PDF? Uh, no, actually, um, here you see the markdown output on the text output, but the main uh, usable output is a JSON output. Uh, you will, where you will have uh, the structured document with the hierarchy of the document. Uh, so we are uh, quite good at identifying title and subtitle uh, with 80, 87% accuracy depending on the type of document, more if it's a PDF where you will have uh, better data than OCR. And uh, we are around 50% accuracy at uh, identifying the level of the title uh, that we have identified. And this coupled with reading order gives you kind of a structured document where you can note that uh, this paragraph belongs to part two, subpart three, or something like that. And uh, one of the main reasons we built this tool was actually when we start working with legal document or regulation or contract, uh, most of the time they come in multi-column, uh, highly hierarchical documents. And actually, if you want any kind of uh, useful extraction, uh, you need to know in which part of the document you extract the word or uh, the sentence. Uh, yeah. It's not 100% yet. We are working on it. We are more like at 80% accuracy generally on the heading detection. That's great. Thank you. Construction. Look, looks like a very good resource. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Roland. 
Uh, okay, so um, so I think Sarah mentioned that um, you're committed to sustaining this effort for at least two years. So did I understand that right? Yes. Yes. And, and what is the what is sort of the focus of this? Is this just to to increase the accuracy and extracting the features that you're extracting currently, or are you planning to um, extract further information from the PDF? So maybe even go into the the content itself and uh, extracting arguments or concept, other concepts? So the focus actually, uh, in the beginning, we were also focused on extracting and classifying clauses in document or things like that. Uh, we roll back to only working on the cleaning the text to get the most clean and most structured uh, in a way that reflects the reality of the document uh, output. Uh, because we found that there is a lot of startup and people doing a lot of great work actually on data extraction and uh, on the processing in top of documents. Uh, but there is a very little people working in the problems that don't bring value directly to the business or to the startup or to the research, which is actually getting uh, a clean data uh, on top of which you will apply your machine learning on NLP. So we will still focus at least for the next two years. Uh, we are committed into trying to increase the accuracy of the reconstruction and the quality of the data out of the platform. Uh, I, have, I have some questions. Thank you. Um, uh, I have some questions. Uh, let me first of all say, uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not in the legal, um, uh, I'm, I'm a software guy who's interested. Um, so some of you might be naive. Um, the context in which uh, somebody will be searching documents that's in a way that's relevant to the concerns of this group, uh, some of those will be adversarial contexts. Some of those will be contexts where the source of the document might have preferred the document to resist um, searchability. Uh, have you thought about uh, the um, uh, trying to recognize uh, in documents that might have been constructed to look perfectly legible to a human reader, but to resist automated, automated searching. So that's an interesting idea. Um, actually, in our group, uh, we are mostly focused on document tech and the legal technology. Uh, we haven't been uh, focusing on anti-fraud or anti-adversarial net uh, methods, uh, but there is other group uh, in our company working on these topics. I will not be able to. Okay. Uh, Can I jump in? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go, uh, go ahead. So I, I wonder if you've tried to train it on historical documents um, in in either English or, or other languages to, to try to let it see, for instance, the structure of a constitution um, and, and to, to see if it can recognize that. So unfortunately today we are very bad at handwriting recognition and not only us, but uh, globally as a computer science community. Uh, there is a lot of uh, scientific effort going on. Uh, I'm aware of a couple effort on historical documents in Europe, uh, but you have to do custom train model for every type of documents. Today, you can't do it in a generic way. Uh, you don't have a good enough accuracy uh, when you try to do handwriting recognition. And the constitution, for example, will be handwritten, and uh, it's very hard to read the characters. It comes with a full set of uh, topics. Thank you, Pierre and Sierra. And Sarah, I, I'm curious if you are primarily French language focused, English language focused or other, where uh, French language is official language in 29 countries out of about 200 countries. Uh, so by your accent, uh, you certainly guess we all speak French, uh, <laughs> but we are also uh, English focused. Uh, and actually, our company operates in 69 uh, different uh, languages. Uh, so uh, we haven't yet have good support for right to left languages. 
uh, but we have quite good support for left to right languages in Latin and alphabet. Uh, and uh, we are trying to explore Japanese and the Chinese currently. Thank you. Okay, uh, great questions, uh, Sarah, and Pierre, Sarah and Pierre. If you guys could drop your email in the chat so if people have any follow-up questions, that'd be great. But if we all give them applause, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Pia Andrews, who's a digital government specialist. Pia, who most recently led digital government initiatives for New South Wales, Australia, will update us on Rules as Code, a global movement working towards a world where regulation and legislation are created in both human and machine consumable form to reduce the translation gap for implementation and improve public access information. Pia, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll just do a quick introduction on the video first, but then I'm going to switch to, um, I'm going to do a little bit of a deck and then some demonstration or, or uh, to show you what I'm talking about. Quite often, um, people take different things from these presentations, <clears throat> excuse me, but I really want you to leave this with a, with a tactile feeling for what rules as code mean. Um, so, uh, so my name is Pia Andrews. I, um, uh, my background is largely in implementation around digital technology, data, systems uh, for governments. Can everyone please mute themselves? Thank you very much. Um, and um, I have, uh, I am not a rules, not traditionally been a rules maker. I've traditionally been a, a rules consumer, um, a, a, a person who needs to integrate lots and lots of rules across lots of different systems. And um, in doing so, uh, the quality and access to rules is really, really important to me. Um, the room, can you please mute yourselves or do you want me to mute you? Yeah. Uh, we'll go ahead and mute, but you're, um, if we chime in, uh, give us a little bit of uh, time to unmute. Oh, no, no, for sure. It's just there's a lot of background noise and it just makes it a bit distracting. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. So, um, so, but then I've also been involved in uh, designing policy and basically how this story started was uh, we were trying to build uh, integrated services. Well, actually how the story started was I was working for a financial and intelligence um, regulatory agency in Australia. And uh, when you look at the regulatory rules, the anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism funding and know your customer rules, otherwise known as AML, CTF, KYC, um, it's a very, very complex set of, set of rules and laws and legislation and regulations. Um, and we found in the Australian context um, you know, over a 10 page single clause, there might a triple negative, you know, logic constructs that were just really hard to unpack and to implement. And so we started thinking, well, we could do what everyone does right now, which is to do an interpretation and then hard code those rules into our business systems. Or we could try to find someone else that already hosts the rules and try to integrate those uh, across multiple different systems, but that would be very, very hard to create a translation layer because um, then you're dealing with lots of different standards and approaches. And we started thinking, well, what if we had api.legislation.gov.au? What if we actually had the rules that lend themselves to being prescriptive and already pre-codified in the, in the very logic that they are, you know, age equals 18, et cetera. Uh, you have to report something over $10,000 worth of, um, of, of transaction. You know, for all of those sort of fairly prescriptive things, if we had api.legislation.gov.au and we could draw in the legislative rules, we could then complement them with our operational rules, and uh, then we would actually have a consistency of rules across the government that we could um, integrate for all kinds of different systems. So let me jump into the presentation uh, for a second. And if that works, uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, so uh, what I thought I'd do is a, a little presentation that I like to call Machines Are Users Too. We, we quite often, a lot of people have got on the um, uh, user-centered design, human-centered design um, shtick, which is great, but um, quite often the actual core consumers of our rules are actually machines. So I'm going to talk about two concepts today. The first one's about translating rules into code for the purpose of implementation or regulation or compliance. Um, but the second one, which goes very much to the point and, um, and several of the questions from the previous um, presentation, is about changing the way that we draft rules in the first place to be more test driven, to be more confident that the application of the rules meets the original intent of the rules. And, um, and that concept of actually evolving the drafting process of legislation and regulation, uh, we're going to call better rules. So there's two parts of this legislation as code or rules as code and better rules. Um, 
there's four key reasons why we're looking at this. Um, and we, we <laughs> there was originally, um, um, there's some efforts happening uh, in Australia around this uh, in New Zealand and the New South Wales government um, from the teams that I've run in those jurisdictions. Um, but of course, people have been translating rules into code um, since rules were first invented and since machines were first invented. Um, the, the key thing that's different about what we're doing is, um, is trying to actually get, if you like, authoritative rules as code that can be implemented by everyone. Um, but we need better rules. Quite often what's written into language, whether it's um, English or French or any other language, any other human language, um, you might get precision from a human understanding but you actually uh, can often lose precision from a, what does that mean in the code basis? Uh, what does that mean in implementation? So getting, we, we need rules that are really, really clear. Uh, for example, we had a, um, a benefit in my most recent um, uh, role around this, uh, where the benefit kicked in, a, it, it said in the regulation, four and a half years. And we said, well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean 365 divided by two? Do you mean, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, divided by two. Do you mean uh, six months? Do you mean, um, X many of days, do you mean 26 weeks? Uh, it is actually quite different. And even though that gap um, between those different implementations might be small, it's still a gap and that still creates an issue about access to justice and, and, um, and access to entitlements and, and all kinds of other things. Uh, there was an example where the rule, uh, there was a Holidays Act um, piece of regulation in New Zealand, which was quite specifically about defining the rules around holiday pay. And what they found was the way it was drafted um, so much w w was so hard to in, uh, apply consistently because they, they didn't test it before applying it that they um, ended up having it misimplemented across um, everyone including the department that actually administered it uh, leading to about a billion dollars in mispayments uh, across the economy and about 16 oh sorry I think it was 12 million dollars in mispayments just in the public service alone so um, you want to have a you, you want to completely reduce the translation gap. You want to know that the thing that you intend people to apply is what they apply, rather than writing something, people then translating it, and um, and then it being implemented. And I, I sort of joke, and it's a bit cheeky, that um, because we're getting lawyers effectively to read legislation or regulations, interpret it into functional requirements, which then gets gives to given to a developer to implement in a digital technology, we're effectively translating from analog to digital, which is like a modem. So we're using lawyers as modems. And my lawyer husband uh, tells me that that's um, not particularly polite, but I'm sure that you will all um, enjoy, the, um, enjoy the, the analogy. So the second thing is we need to adapt to digital new paradigms. Um, the, the way that we scale the impact of rules is changing. I was in a regulators conference recently where they said, um, well, our um, regulation around uh, medical, internal medical devices is perfect. It's the problem was the technologist that implemented it badly. Um, and I said, well, as one of your besmirched technologists, um, if you'd had a technologist in the room when you did the regulation, we would have pointed out that having open wireless, open wireless on a heart monitor or internal insulin um, device uh, might have been a bad idea. Because then of course you can join, you can just you know, join that person's device over, the, over, over a wireless internet. And, um, and jump their heart, which isn't exactly you'd, you'd assume in alignment with medical um, outcomes. So um, you wanna have multidisciplinary approaches. You wanna have test-driven approaches to drafting. You wanna um, have uh, iterative approaches to the, the improvements of those, of those rules and regulations. Uh, shaping society is no longer just about human behavior. It isn't just humans that, that um, are subject to the rules and regulations. A lot of the consumers are actually machines. And as we're getting into a world where we're having more and more self-perpetuating um, software, whether it's an AI or something else, um, all of the usual constraints of, you know, um, of EULAs, of, of end user license agreement style approaches to law, which says by applying this rule, you're, you're, subs, you know, you're subject to the legal, financial or criminal pressures. Machines are not motivated in that way. And so if you're assuming that a, a human imperative is going to drive the right behavior and yet the consumer of your rule is not a human, um, it, it may not get the impact that you expect, which is why we're getting some pretty awful things happening around machines that are trying to um, interface with uh, algorithms like Google and, and YouTube algorithms and then leading to some pretty um, uh, perverse outcomes. And finally, we need to make sure we don't just repeat the status quo with shiny new things. There are a lot of tools 
a lot of tools and more emerging every day that are trying to automate the law, that are trying to digitize things, that are trying to um, um, make things a bit easier. But if we don't look at the actual paradigm, if we don't actually look at the, the, what we're trying to achieve and say, how could we achieve something different um, in the current, um, in the 21st century, as opposed to how do I just digitize this or digitize this or automate that or improve that? If you basically just iterate and improve, you're going to end up with a status quo with shiny new things. You're not actually going to get uh, fit for purpose rules uh, in the 21st century. I wanted to quickly talk um, for those who are involved in regulation, um, just quickly. Um, the, the, I have seen a lot of cases where the purpose and goals are, uh, become distinct. So in the case of financial intelligence, we were looking at, you know, the actual purpose is to strengthen the financial system against abuse. But if your goals then become, if your two weapons become compliance and intelligence, and in both cases, you start to see compliance, um, you know, um, but in both cases, they are rewarded and measured. The success is measured by the amount of arrests or, not, or compliance breaches they find. They're actually weirdly perversely incentivized to not strengthen the financial system against abuse because they're being measured on the success of how many they, they catch. And yet the actual amount of AML um, uh, money laundering and, and criminal activities that are being disrupted, um, it, it's been measured is somewhere around 3% or less, which is really, really scary. So making sure that your actual overarching purpose is strengthened by the goals, not um, left behind by the, by the tactics that you employ are really, really critical. So I'm going to jump into rules as code briefly. Um, I've spoken a little bit that the two key areas around that, that are important for rules as code, just as general takeaways are service delivery and regulation. Um, there are a lot, we are not talking about automating law. We're not talking about automating justice or where judgment is important at all. Um, although exemptions that uh, or exceptions that um, emerge over time might be codified, but you, you want to maintain human judgment in uh, where it is appropriate. But I'll come back to principles in a moment. There are a lot of text, uh, a lot of words on these slides. Because uh, Pia, Pia, sorry to interrupt your flow. You've got your mic is on your um, cord there and your gestures keep bumping it. So just oh, okay, so you know, we, we keep here. Yeah, sorry about that. No, no, no. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I'll sure. Gesticulation is uh, my, my, um, <laughs> my, uh, my. No, medicine. keep going, but it's been going on for a while. <laughs> sorry. Thank you so much. Um, uh -huh. So the, um, yeah, so, so basically, um, the the there's a lot of words here please don't worry too much because you've all got the slides um the problem we have i've talked about unintended consequences and the gap between translation and implementation but there's also an efficiency issue here if something is uh, enacted in parliament then you have to know about it then you have to read it then you have to translate it then you have to implement it the gap the time it takes to implement a change is very very long if however you use the better rules approach and you're doing human and machine consumable rules from the start then you can enact um, the law, the human readable version. We are not suggesting to enact code in the parliament, but to enact a human readable version that has been isomorphically drafted with a machine readable version, then you could put the API up, the machine readable version of those rules, or at least the, the prescriptive part of those rules at exactly the same time as it's enacted in parliament, dramatically reducing the time it takes for those uh, rules to be implemented and dramatically reducing the cost. Um, I had just one bank tell us that if we took just the prescriptive rules of AML, CTF, KYC and made them available as code by the government, it would save them $16 million a year. So um, our broad current scope is around service delivery, prescriptive rules, um, sorry, service delivery and regulation, prescriptive rules, edge cases that might be codified over time and the opportunity to collaborate with the parliamentary council officers um, or office of the parliamentary council, whatever it's called in your jurisdiction, uh, on shaping the drafting guidelines and methods to incorporate better rules methods, which I'll get into uh, presently. Just to be clear, rules as code is not automated law. It's not XML. So structured content is a great way to improve um, the ability to interrogate data. It's a great way to uh, structure how you present it, but it doesn't make it machine readable. The child must be of 18 years of age isn't the same as, you know, age over 18, you know, age equals more than 18. You need to have the rules available in a programmatic way. And I'll give you some examples of that in, in a moment. It is also not, and this is very important, it's not the interpretational translation 
on the fly. It's not these um, um, engines that say, let's, um, well, you've got the rules over there in, in the law, let's um, you know, automatically translate them into a rules engine and, um, and then let's uh, use that. Because if you're just translating on the fly, then, um, and if you actually combine the rules with the logic, you actually lose uh, a little bit of the reusability of those rules. But I'll come back to that. It's not an AI and it's not a website. Um, lots of benefits I've sort of implied, but these are just here for you to look at a bit later. But the key one I haven't mentioned yet is modeling. When you make, as the French government have done, and I absolutely in, in, you know, suggest you all check out the French uh, government's work with Open Fisca, which is a fantastic tool developed for rules as code. They, because they put the entire taxation system and benefit system, so all of the rules and eligibility and calculation information about finance, um, into a single rules engine called Open Fisca. It means they can do modeling, they can do legislative reforms. They can say, well, if I change this or include this or remove this, what impact will it have not only on my budget, but on the demographics, you know, uh, what, what, in, what unintended consequences will it create? If I introduce this rule set, will it actually um, make it so that someone is suddenly not eligible who should be eligible? So it gives you the ability to have greater confidence in, in deploying change because where we are now, as opposed to 100 years ago, is we have so many rules that every change in the rules is not just a small change. It's, it's all exponential in the complexity that we're creating. So we need, we need tools to be able to interrogate and test and um, uh, the impact of change in order to trust the outcome for ourselves, but also for the public trust. If the public can't see how the rules are being implemented, doesn't matter how they're written and how they're accessible from a human English readability perspective. If they're being implemented badly, that's a terrible, terrible thing. We had a case in New Zealand where we found a particular rebate that was mis that was wrongly implemented um, um, from from the actual legislation, and I'll show you the exact example of that in a moment. There's a lot of use cases. I won't jump into these too much, but the key thing here is the current state is someone drafts something and then it gets enacted. Um, like, you know, there's a whole process of policy and drafting and back and forth with ministers and all the rest of it. So if something gets enacted in parliament and then everyone, you have myriad interpretations, which leads to myriad efforts to implement it into business logic, which leads to, you know, um, very limited ability to understand whether the rules are being implemented in the way that you expect and, and zero oversight and accountability to that. Um, and what happens is that regulators with diminishing amounts of resources end up having to just say, well, let's put all of our resource into risk modeling so that we can go after the 5% that we can afford to, uh, to review. Well, if you actually were monitoring the, um, the regulated entity's usage of the rules, you could actually have 100% compliance monitoring in real time. So the future is about actually co-drafting a human and machine readable version of the rules, of the legislation, of the regulations. Um, then enacting the human readable version and having the API officially available. And then you get myriad implementations, but not myriad interpretations. So then you get lots of opportunities for uh, monitoring that and uh, having trust and confidence in that and indeed iterating that if it's not working. So in New Zealand, we did a lot of um, rules as code for service delivery. So we pulled together the eligibility and calculation rules of about 30 uh, different things for uh, 30 different rebates for a particular service. Uh, I won't go through that too much. The French government have done. Uh, Pia? Uh, yes. Pia, just one thing. Uh, we want to leave some time for questions. Um, okay. And also, we have our last speaker. So, if you could just wrap up the next like, minute or two, that'd be great. And then we can just take questions. Do some questions. Thank you. No worries. So, the French government, as I said, have modeling and all kinds of other tools. I want to quickly talk about principles then. Um, there's a myth and a real almost ideological shift towards everything should be principles based. And everyone did that, you know, 20. Uh, also years ago, we've really seen a shift towards everything should be a principle. The problem is a principle requires interpretation. It requires someone to take a risk they're doing it right and it actually reduces the consistency. Now, principles are great where you want a judgment, but the, the key ask that I have of all of you and of the entire sector is um, to only use principles where a judgment is actually useful. You know, a, a person should be um, over 18 is easy for me to impl implement. A person should be of an appropriate age for this is, is impossible. So, um, so the key thing here is that principles have their place and we will always need a combination of prescriptive and principles based um, rules, but uh, we shouldn't err uh, too much on either side, otherwise we lose the benefits of both. Um, 
the final thought here is that machine consumer legisla legislation regulation is a precondition for AI to be effective, but also for people to trust the outcomes of that so that we can actually um, monitor and capture under what legislative or regulatory basis a decision is made or an obligation was taken. I'll just very quickly show you if I can. Uh, can you still, oh, you can't see that. Uh, I'll just quickly show you just one last thing if you don't mind. So as a quick example, this is the Rates Rebate Act in New Zealand. You can see just here, this is the actual calculation, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a tricky one. Uh, it turns out I had to use a quadratic equation to actually um, come up with an equation to actually work it out. Um, we then implemented it um, in OpenFisca, which is the French tool, which gives you the chance of capturing all the variables, but also capturing the actual, um, the actual um, calculation, which is here which then was able to feed into this kind of tool. So you can actually have all of your test cases about um, persons of different uh, circumstances, should they get it or not. You can write your test cases and then um, run that through your rules as code system to ensure that you get the outcome that you expect. And then you can use it to implement in myriad different systems. In our case, we used it for a public calculator uh, for application services that were then used by lots of others and to integrate with a whole bunch of other services. So I'll leave it there. There are practical toolkits around how to do the better rules work about how to do the co-drafting of human and machine readable um, rules which i highly recommend to you and then there's also a guide here about rules as code ironically well i guess um, this is a beautiful uh, demonstration of how um, effective we've been at our multidisciplinary teams our better rules workshop for drafting better rules uh, was written by a developer and our rules as code um, um, guide was actually, uh, which is about how to do coding of rules, was actually written by a lawyer. So uh, that's a nice little uh, way to finish, I think. So um, I'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pia. Really appreciate it. Um, that was a great presentation. Yes. And any uh, questions in the room? Yeah, so, how, what, this, so there's a the key part to this is to, to publish the laws in the machine readable form from the get-go and how, how are you doing on that kind of social change front? So, uh, so social change? interesting to learn a little bit more about your use cases. Uh, I think oh, that's, sure. that's the, 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 seems to be the, sure. uh, so ju the hard just to be thing is to get the lawmakers to adopt this new approach of publishing the rules. So there's this whole advocacy aspect of your work and uh, social change aspect and that's the tech. Sure. So social interestingly, social change. Sure. So interestingly, the social change is. We can't so hear hard. you on mute. I didn't put me on mute. Oh, sorry. Okay. No. My apologies. Right. It's on my no, side. No, that's okay. It's at your side. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so the social change isn't actually that. Uh, so for starters, we started this entire process with lawmakers in the room. In fact, the very first um, hypothesis we did in New Zealand. Uh, we did a, just a two-week experiment with two things, the Holidays Act and the Rates Rebate Act, that both of which I've talked about, uh, because both were complete fails, uh, one on the service delivery side, one on a compliance side. And we had the policy people, the law, um, the drafters from the Parliamentary Council's office, um, had developers and service design people in a room together. Not a huge group. No one had money to invest in, in exploring this, but everyone had time. So we just said, why don't we just get the people together for two weeks and we'll explore the hypothesis of the, be the potential benefits of machine readable rules. And, um, and it was really amazing because um, right now, the actual best speech about this entire space is from the person who still is a legislative drafter in the New Zealand government because he talks that language. Um, so basically we have a situation now where we have a, a multidisciplinary community of, of lawyers, of drafters, of policy, of developers, of service design and delivery people who all are seeing the value to them and to better rules and to better outcomes, better public outcomes, better policy outcomes, um, better compliance outcomes, service delivery outcomes. Everyone's speaking their own language to their own crew. And that's um, actually working really well. Our prime minister in Australia, who used to be the treasurer, that with public speeches talking about how um, the holy grail of rules is to have them designed as code from, from the start. So that's been helpful. <laughs> um, but at the same time, the, the, by doing it in small, in small increments and small experiments, the results are so self-evident 
that the results speak for themselves. So the social side of it, the people obviously get a bit worried then about, well, what about justice? What about law? And we very quickly um, engage with that conversation and talk about this isn't about um, automating law or digitizing um, justice. This is about um, primarily about service delivery and, and compliance uh, improvements, but maintaining uh, judgment where things. So, so the answer to that is interesting. The community is just growing and the, and the, op and it's solving a problem that people currently have where they don't have transparency to what a machine is doing. If you have black box decision-making, you actually lose the ability for auditability and for appealability. So the opportunities here, it just, it just, it just ticks the box for everybody. Thank you. Is Pia going to have, uh, give us her slides? I was just, there's so much uh, material there. I'd really love to be able to see them. Yeah, she, she dropped it into chat. Oh, wait, there. Okay. Yeah. All right, I don't, I'm not have that. Okay. And uh, Pia, um, could you put your email into chat yeah. before we all leave? And they'll, this will be posted too. That's right. great. Yeah. Great, great presentation, Pia. It was great. Thank you. Normally I have a little longer, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry it was so yeah, rushed. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, a bit of a fire hose, but, but great. <laughs> but <content>. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, look, the, the, probably the last thing to say is that what will happen, and, um, and please allow yourselves the, the time for this to happen. For those who haven't heard the concepts before, and I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have dealt with, you know, the intersection of tech and law for a long, long time, obviously, but so, some of what I've gone through will start to hit um, a few weeks or months in, or at least it did for us. You might be a lot faster than I take a few days. Um, uh, th there were some key opportunities in this that we've been working on this for three and a half years. So, um, you know, I, I, hi I hope always that the people that I speak to can leapfrog where we've, you know, our efforts, but at the same time, there is a lot of nuance and thought that's gone into this. So um, please engage with the community. There is a, a link in the slides that I've sent to, um, and if you just give me one second, I'll just put this up just briefly. There's a, a link to um, there's a whole community of people in this space. Uh, and um, I think you can hopefully see that link up there now. That um, Better Rules community is a really great one. And please join in and have a conversation with people. Um, there, there's, there's a community growing around this very rapidly. And, um, and the problem is that, that there are a lot of people that just say, oh, just use this tool or just use that tool. For, from our perspective, this is actually a shift in how we think about rules and how we build the trust infrastructure for the 21st century. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Kate Sills, a software engineer from Agoric. Ms. Sills will discuss the electronic rights transfer protocol, a framework that allows for the creation of composable electronic rights. ERTP enables generically, parameterizable smart contracts to manipulate a broad spectrum of electronic rights, both fungible, non-fungible, exclusive, shared, and others. And I'll turn it over to you, Kate. All right, well, uh, thank you so much for the intro. Um, so I'm actually gonna be talking about something today that builds on top of ERTP. At the time that I think we were signing up for this uh, slot, we weren't able to publicly talk about this, so I'm really excited to share it with you guys now. Um, but what I'm talking about is, um, adding a layer of safety to smart contracts that we haven't seen before. Um, and we call that offer safety. So let's see. All right, so just to give some context, um, you might be familiar with smart contracts that build on Ethereum in Solidity on top of the EVM, something like that. Um, we are not doing that. We're building on top of the Cosmos network and they use the Tendermint uh, consensus algorithm. So just to provide some context, um, this, is, this is the Agoric stack. So we're not on Ethereum. All right, so today I'll be talking about that top part of the Agoric stack, which is the user-defined contracts, Zoe, which I'll explain, and uh, ERTP, which you just heard about. Okay, so what is a smart contract? Um, we kind of have a different perspective than you might have heard. So we define a smart contract as a contract-like arrangement expressed in code, where the behavior of the program enforces the terms of the contract. So I think there's, there's two important things here. One is that um, by smart contract, we don't, merely mean code that runs on a blockchain. We actually mean something more than that. And then secondly, um, by smart contract, we don't mean a legal contract necessarily. We think that's a, a separate definition. Okay, so, so let's get into it. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, ERC20 tokens on Ethereum, um, 
ERC-20 tokens enable one-way payments. So, you know, you just want to pay someone. And the ERC-20 tokens, they have a, um, a ledger or a registry within the code that defines that token. So um, I've kind of tried to replicate that here. It's very simplistic, so, you know, bear with me. But uh, let's say that Alice has a digital asset. Let's call that X. And she wants to transfer it to Bob. So in the, uh, the registry or the ledger here on the right, um, now Bob has X, right? Very simple. All right, so let's say that uh, the payment is actually conditional. Let's say that Alice only wants to give X to Bob if Bob gives Y to Alice, right? So uh, let's say Alice does the exchange first, but then we have a problem, right? So um, at time T1, Bob has X and Y, meaning that he could walk away with both. And I'm sure you're familiar with this, right? It um, goes back to Hobbes, right, 1600, saying that, uh, the person who performs first has no assurance that the other will perform after because the bonds of words are too weak. Um, Oliver Williamson built on this point. He called uh, this an example of opportunism um, or self-interest seeking with guile. And then Anthony Cronman, uh, going back to Hobbes, labeled this situation transactional insecurity. So we kind of know that this is a societal problem that we need to solve and it's traditionally been solved by legal contracts or the legal system. Okay, so smart contracts solve this problem of transactional insecurity, and, and this is really, really cool. So um, if we introduce a smart contract, instead of Alice giving X to Bob, Alice and Bob can both put their assets in the smart contract. So this is going to sound a little strange, but if you look at the, the registry or the ledger to the right, you can see that, at least in code, the smart contract is holding assets in the same way that Alice and Bob are holding assets. So Alice's address has X at time T0, Bob's address has Y at time T0. At time T1, uh, the smart contract address is now the, whatever you want to call it, the holder of the digital assets. And so whether this, whether this is actually legal ownership is a question I'll leave for you all. Um, <laughs> I'm not the expert there. Um, but what's really, really cool is that if we give the assets to the smart contract and effectively kind of put it in escrow, Alice and Bob never have access to both X and Y, and so we've solved the problem of transactional insecurity. And so, so we fulfilled the exchange safely. So that's great. The problem is, uh, as you might have noticed, the smart contract is holding all the assets now. So what if that smart contract is buggy or malicious, right? And this is actually a huge problem. So um, there's this great paper called uh, Greedy, Prodigal, and Suicidal Contracts at Scale. And I, I know, great names, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so they defined these, these three identifiers of contracts that are probably problematic in the Ethereum world. So uh, Greedy, they defined as locked, locks up the digital assets indefinitely. Prodigal is uh, sending digital assets to an arbitrary user, one that you haven't seen before probably. And uh, this is most likely an attacker or some kind of mistake. Suicidal, um, this is specific to Ethereum, but this means that the contract invoked the, the quote, suicide instruction as part of the EVM, meaning that the contract um, basically deletes itself. So they analyzed nearly a million contracts. They found that uh, quite a few of them were vulnerable to one or more of these issues. And um, what was really cool was that they were using symbolic execution to do this search. They were, you know, they were using machines to do the search and they found um, a parity bug that had already been found, but that you know they were able to find it using this method. And that parity bug had uh, locked up a hundred million dollars worth in ether. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars worth of problems here in the smart contract space. Okay, so uh, that was the idea behind Zoe. <laughs> and I think you're actually wearing the same outfit today. <laughs> Um, so, I, I did not know this was coming up. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't have his collar out. Yeah, there we go. There we go. There you um, go. So, uh, so Mark S. Miller, who's uh, at Agoric uh, with us, um, came up with this idea. And uh, given that if the digital assets are locked up in a smart contract and, you know, that causes all of these problems, well, what if there was a way that the smart contract wasn't actually holding the digital assets? And this is the idea behind what we call Zoe. So what we're doing here is we're trying to partition the risk in smart contracts. So there's really two roles. Uh, the first role is escrowing and redistributing digital assets. 
And then the second role is deciding how the digital asset should be redistributed. So I'll kind of explain what that means. So, so by escrowing, this means, you know, um, taking all of the digital assets and holding them, right? And so that's what uh, our framework, which we call Zoe does. And then for the second role, this is where your custom behavior or your complex business logic comes in. So this might be, as uh, we saw in the example, just a simple swap. It may be an auction. It may be a digital exchange with the order book. It may be uh, some complex mechanism design. Um, it may be a negotiated uh, contract that actually kind of looks more like a legal contract. Whatever it is that you want that logic to be, uh, that's where the decision of how the digital asset should be redistributed would go. So um, when we go back to conditional payments, um, we call those offers. And an offer is defined as uh, saying what you want and then saying what you are willing to offer in exchange. So going back to our example, uh, Alice was willing to offer X and she wanted Y in return. Bob was willing to offer Y and he wanted X in return. So this, this seems very simple and very obvious, but the really cool thing is that once you have users define things in terms of offers, then we can enforce this new principle, this new safety principle that we call offer safety. And under offer safety, a user is guaranteed to either get what they stated they wanted or get a full refund of what they offered. And connected to offer safety is another kind of um, uh, CS principle that we call uh, payout liveness. And this says that a user is guaranteed to get a payout in a timely manner according to the conditions under which they made their offer. Okay, so um, how does this actually work? So I have kind of a very high level diagram here. Um, so we have the parties to the smart contract on the left here, and they exchange digital assets with Zoe. So the escrowing, um, they escrow their digital assets with Zoe. The parties are able to talk to the smart contract. The smart contract is able to talk to Zoe, but importantly, the smart contract never actually gets asset gets access to the digital assets. So let's uh, let's walk through this with um, let's say that we are making a bid on an auction. Um, so uh, let's first escrow our goods with Zoe. Then we'll tell the smart contract, hey, you know, I, I put these in escrow. I'd like to make a bid on this auction. Um, then the smart contract may send us information back saying like, yes, I've accepted your offer, whatever it is, this is up to the smart contract. Yeah, just want to make sure. uh -huh. the, the, um, that is both assets, that there's an X, there's a red X and a black Y. I'm trying to understand. Oh, Does yeah. that notation mean that, that Zoe has received both assets, one from each party, or that he's received an offer from one party where uh, one of those is what they're saying they want? Uh, I think I'm, I'm doing this much more abstractly. So you can think of the X, as y, X and Y as kind of a, the general idea of assets. Yeah, nothing, nothing as specific as what you were talking about. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so the smart contract can, you know, will say, you, you know, we've accepted the offer, whatever it is that that contract wants to say. And then the contract uh, does its own custom behavior. So in the case of an auction, it may hold the bids and, you know, until maybe it gets a certain number of bids, uh, you know, three or something like that, or maybe until a certain deadline has been met. But um, once the smart contract decides to close the auction, then it will try to reallocate the digital assets. Um, so this is the, the very important part where offer safety comes in. So the smart contract uh, calls Zoe and tells it to reallocate with certain information saying, give this to this person, give this to this person. Um, Zoe does a check of offer safety. And if, if offer safety isn't met, if everyone won't, act, won't either get what they said they wanted or get a full refund back, then Zoe rejects this reallocation. So Zoe is actually protecting the parties from malicious behavior by the smart contract in this regard. So if the reallocation passes, offer safety and all of the other invariants, then the smart contract can say complete the offers and this will actually result in a payout to the parties and that's where the transfer of the digital assets occurs. So you can see kind of throughout this whole process, um, the smart contracts never actually had access to any of the digital assets. The users were protected against uh, malicious behavior by the smart contract for that, um, by that. And then also Zoe additionally protected um, the parties by enforcing offer safety. So this may seem very simple, but it's actually, I, I think it's going to be really amazing because we're gonna be able to enable um, 
very rapid innovation in smart contracts. You know, we can have people who aren't necessarily expert programmers be building these smart contracts um, and uh, building entirely new things that we haven't seen before, new types of DAOs, what have you. And at the same time, we'll be able to protect the users from malicious or just poorly written code. So, um, so that's kind of the overview of Zoe. And uh, if you're interested in some resources, uh, all of our stuff is written in JavaScript. So this is actually a JavaScript package. If, if you're familiar with that, you can install it right now. Um, this is kind of the pre-alpha version, so we're still working on it. Uh, we have documentation. And if you're interested, you can take a look at the code. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions if we have some time. Yes, that's great. I'll open up the room for questions. Yeah. Uh, so who is who's um, in control of the logic that goes into Zoe? So I'm, I'm trying to think yeah, about yeah. where the safety comes from, right? So like insofar as the average user probably can't self out of the smart contract, there seems to be that same kind of trust problem with Zoe, unless they can write their own logic. Right, right. Um, so you're right. The, uh, the user is trusting Zoe to a great extent. Uh, we think there's still a significant, um, we still think this is a significant benefit to the user, though, because they only have to look at the Zoe code once because um, it, it can't be easily changed, right? And so, so once they're assured that the Zoe code does the, what they want, then they can interact with these smart contracts that maybe they don't, they haven't looked at as much or they don't trust as much. And the worst that can happen is that they'll get a refund back yeah. if things misbehave. So, so um, that's actually a very good point. So to point out, like the, the smart contract can still be malicious in that, let's say it's an auction, it could award the wrong person as you know the the item as the winner. It could um, it could do something really strange and not do an auction thing at all. Um, but what it can't do is steal everyone's funds. So which has been the huge problem, the million dollar problem Got in it. the past. It's like an yeah. abstraction layer where it's, it almost like ports into a bunch of different smart contracts yeah. and not like a one-to-one. -one. Okay. Yeah. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a global, slightly basic question, but by having Zoe in the entire ecosystem, does that also allow you to have a simpler smart contract because you're not trying to program for every single yes. Um, yes. possible scenario? <laughs> Definitely. Um, so I've been written, I've been writing, um, I think we have like maybe five or so just example smart contracts, like an auction, a swap, a, a covered call, which would be like a financial option, um, things like that. And uh, I would say it's, it's analogous to having like a, um, a payment service provider in e-commerce. Whereas like, you know, if you just want to have your Etsy site or something, you don't have to deal with handling all of the credit card payments and things like that. So if you're, if you just want to, you have a good idea for a smart contract, you just want to write that, you don't have to deal with all of the messiness of making sure that you're escrowing the payments correctly, you know, um, dealing with people's funds, things like that. You can just write the particular business logic for that smart contract and really focus on that. And that's hard enough. You don't need to focus on all of the rest of the escrowing. Nice. Yeah. So you can really think of Zoe as an escrow and an audit tool combined? I think you could say that, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what, so I just want to drill down on that. What do you mean by audit? So thank you. Um, great point. Um, I meant the offer checking. So the offer validation, I consider that sort of an audit of the smart contract. So, I mean, so I'm totally non-technical, mm -hmm. so I could be way off base. But uh, So I'm, I'm not... I, um, the reason why I, I perked up my ears at audit is audit is, is, as I understand it, is normally talking about looking into the past and what had happened mm -hmm. as opposed to enforcing uh, uh, constraints on what can happen. I see. Yeah, I, I mean, if you think of audit in the forensic sense of this yeah. kind of past history, yeah, I was thinking like a live quality checking, if you will. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah exactly. Okay. Uh, looks like we have, um, so um, Yongjing, I might not have pronounced that correctly. Um, the prerequisite for Zoe is ownership must be digitally controllable. Um, yes, that's, that's correct. So, um, so Zoe can only control digital assets. So, um, so right now that's pretty limited, but you know, that still covers all of the cryptocurrencies, any kind of uh, you know, financial assets that you can express digitally, things like that. Um, so anything that is physical that might have a digital representation, there's still the problem of figuring out how to have enforcement on the physical level that matches the enforcement on the digital level. So, so that is uh, definitely a prerequisite, you're right. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a separate problem. It's a, <laughs> it's a problem with or without Zoe. And Zoe neither contributes nor contributes it to uh, solving the problem, nor does it contribute to making the problem worse. It's just mm -hmm. sort of an orthogonal problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. From a user experience standpoint, would there be kind of like a different set of problems for like, let's say stealing like $50 million rather than like a simple $50 transaction? Like maybe just like uh, suggesting that the user kind of more carefully reviews Zoe and the actual smart contract itself, or is it kind of like a universal, uniform experience rather? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a very good question. So, so far, everything that I've been mentioning is purely at the code API level, but you can imagine that at the user level, um, your wallet might be um, um, attuned to things like that, saying like, you know, that, hey, you're making a million dollar transaction. Are you sure you don't want to do this, this, and this first to check it? So, um, so we don't account for that, but that's because this is very low level. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Uh, I think yes. Roland has said happy holidays, everyone, so maybe that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kate. That was amazing. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, yeah, I was saying also <laughs> verbally too. Yep. <laughs> happy holidays, everyone. This was our last session this year, so have a great time. And, uh, see you all uh, in the new year. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. See you all next year. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.